Come on up. Let's welcome Gwen. You have your clicker. I do have the clicker. Excellent. Yeah, I do. Excellent. This is perfect. Cool. All yours. Thank you so much, Bill. Hi, everyone. Gunaiden. Correct? Yes. Okay. Gu and not gu, right? So Gunaiden. Okay. So hi again. Um, so today, okay, my name is Gwen. Um, I'm an entrepreneur residence at Entrepreneur First, and I'll introduce Entrepreneur First in a short bit in more detail, but we are a deep tech talent investor. So we were one of the first few in the world. We would like to say we're the first, but again, a world is huge, so I'm, we can't be absolutely 100% sure. Um, but we invest in a category of talent investing. And so here I would like to share with you today how that came into being and what really is talent investing. This, the concept may not apply to most of you here because I think many of you are startups, right? Who are startups? Yeah, like basically everyone. Who are investors? Okay, some of you, yeah. So hopefully this gives you an idea what's happening, you know, our point of view. So, okay, this, uh, this is a PDF I just realized, but everyone has seen this, right? The person dropping down? No? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so basically if you see, this is, is, is going down, 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 up, up, down, slash, down. It's one circle. Sorry, just PDF and not a PowerPoint. So who feels this way, where you're tumbling and tumbling as you're building a startup, and it's super messy, yeah. A few hands, the rest of you are doing well, I guess, maybe. Um, but we know that this is the real world. I mean, I myself, a little bit of background on myself is that um, I've spent 13 years in the tech startup industry as a founder and also an investor. So I started and sold a media company uh, several years ago. So my media company was focusing on technology startups and the in innovation ecosystem in Southeast Asia. I'm from Singapore. And I also started an investment fund um, in 2007 and still in college. Um, that was because I was working with the Singapore government to invest in seed stage capital. That was because back then, the internet industry was really just starting in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And I was super lucky. I was writing about the, co the companies. I was looking at the developer scene, the entrepreneur scene. And an opportunity was offered up to me and I started a fund. So I started investing 11 years ago. I've seen the growth of the internet industry, tech startups uh, in Southeast Asia and Asia, and I also spent um, a year in the Valley, and I still go back quite often, um, where I still continue to look at innovation globally. So now today, um, at Entrepreneur First, my role is to full-time problem solve. So I work with our individuals, our teams, I hear their ideas, I hear their strategies, I help them locate the real problem that they need to solve. So I've done the whole startup stuff. So I felt this tumbling myself, you know, it was really difficult even though I saw my company. As everyone knows, it's always a journey, ups and downs. You think you're gonna die, you get a client, and then you don't die, and then the next week you may die again, right? So, so now I see that with our teams as well. So this is an analogy for that. Building a startup is like jumping off an airplane and building the parachute on the way down. I'm sure some of you have seen this quote, but essentially it's kind of it. So this is what all of us know, right? A usual startup development phase. You start with idea, concept, you know, maybe a team. You go on, you validate product market fit. You scale, hopefully you scale not just in country, regionally, globally, and you grow big, right? This, let's go down to this. The market generally wins, who agrees with me? If you look at the first one, great team, even if you're amazing, if you meet like a bad market where it's small, it's dying, you will still lose. The market wins, okay? Which means your startup will die. Second, of course, if you're not so good and you're meeting a bad market, of course your company will die too. The last two is interesting. If you're even, even if you're okay entrepreneurs, if you meet a great growing market, you're growing with the tide. You may win, your company may succeed. But today, I want to really kind of look at the last one, where if you're amazing and you meet a great market, you've chosen the right markets, something special can really, really happen. So for us, so why, why this? EF 
is a new wave of investing, like I mentioned, talent investor will create a category of talent investing in the world. If we look at the history of VC, a modern VC of venture capital, this super brief history, it started basically almost 100 years ago, where back then, when you had innovative technologies, it was usually funded by wealthy families, or they took form, they started taking shape inside big corporations. It was only later that the first modern VC, about 20 years later in the 1940s, that a first modern VC firm um, started in the US, where they raised some money from institutional investors, so limited partners, as all the VCs here would know, from, from, several, from nine institutional investors, some of which included um, some of the Ivy Leagues in the US. That went on, we know that there was an explosion in computers and electronics in the 1960s and 70s, and that was, a lot of that was funded by these new VCs. So it really kind of started a wave. But it really, really only exploded in the dot-com era. We all know a lot of people will try to create new internet sites, pets.com, you know, and stuff like that, because you're like, let's kind of take charge of, let's take, take advantage of the internet. And that's when VC also exploded alongside that. So this maps out to, as a VC firm, as we all know, we have accelerators, so a bit more pre-seed kind of stuff where they take in, uh, accelerators take in usually teams, really young, super young teams, maybe with just an idea or a piece of paper. Go into C, you go into Series A. How many companies here are pre-revenue? Okay. How many of you already are kind of like a Series B kind of stage? Okay, here mostly, okay, one Series B. So I think most of you are early stage, right? So we're all in this area, I think. C, Series A, right? Okay. So, but why, but we thought that this model really left out some of the world's most ambitious individuals. Okay, so we were told we, it was crazy to invest pre-idea, build teams from scratch, and to fund individuals, invest in individuals. But we thought, again, that if you continue down the traditional VC model, you will not be able to work with the most impressive individuals that way. Our thesis is that financially, because VCs also have to make money, that the best returns come from backing extraordinary individuals before they ever have a company. So it's individuals. And for us, this is a global thesis. We look at it as a global world opportunity. So for us, we, we think, we hope, we, that Entrepreneur First is the end of geography. So again, I know that many of you are startups, you are not many solo founders. Any solo founders here trying to act it out? Oh, quite a few, okay. So this might actually interest you. Um, and so the second point, your startup is dying, but hopefully not, um, and you're looking to start another one. So this may give you some ideas. But also the last point I think is where I, I feel like that will be most interesting, which is that how VC is also being reinvented. How even a traditional industry like that can be reinvented. So again, who is EF? We're the first, world's first talent investor. We invest in people, pre-team, basically without a co-founder, and even pre-idea. So we invented talent investing, but before everything else. Now, today, we're six cities globally, in Paris, London, Berlin. Singapore, Hong Kong, and Bangalore. So very Europe and Asia for now, even though our general partner is now in the US. So we are a British headquarter, we're a London headquartered British company. We are the leading and largest fund for talent investing. We announced our first close for our latest fund, uh, 115 million, just two months ago. We're funded by some of the world's best investors, including Founders Fund, Greylock Partners, people and, and, and funds from like YC and stuff like that. So LinkedIn's founder, Reid Hoffman, was also one of the first backers of EF. And he's been a great supporter since then. So um, Reid Hoffman's in the middle, and Matt and Alice are our founders. So since 2011, so eight years ago, we founded eight years ago, we've seen, we've have, we have an alumni community now of more than 1,200 people, more than 230 companies, with a combined portfolio valuation of more than $1.5 billion. 
But as all startups do, we even though we invented this new category, it wasn't always that way. We were like a VC startup. So again, our hunch was that you could create a new kind of career path for am ambitious people. Remember, in 2011, there wasn't such a category as talent investing, right? But we believed there were the individuals scattered globally where they were like, no team, no idea, but really wanted to do something with their lives. So we, we started by a, like a not-for-profit graduate scheme. This is our first logo. Uh, super ugly, frankly. Um, so we are, we're not-for-profit. We, we were thinking like, let's create this path for the world. Um, let's, let, we, we cannot make money, we don't know how to make money, but we think it's important enough to do it. So we did it. The founders back then in, the, in London. Offices, which is nothing. So as, as of all startups, we made a lot of mistakes. But today, eight years on, we think we've proven our thesis because we've had a few exits. So entrepreneur first one, the EF one at the, at the top is basically how we call our batches. So we had 30 individuals join us in our first batch. It's because we invested individuals as, as individuals, people first, we bring these, these whole people into a bunch of co cohorts. So the first batch are 30 individuals. And these 30 strangers, they did not know any each other before. They, had, they turned to the companies again, and some of them were acquired, including Represent. It was a platform for crowd selling to, to, for custom merchandise where you could request and create custom merchandise. It was acquired for $100 million a few years ago. Magic Pony is one of the biggest successes. It's imaging AI that was acquired by Twitter for 150 million after just 18 months of two strangers meeting each other. Yeah. So it's, it's surprising, right? How can, from strangers, you create like an exit like that? So how we see how talent investing works is this. For us, when we look at this category, we've learned along the way, again, over the eight years. We've, again, we've made mistakes, we've evolved our methodology, but now we really believe that this, these four points is really what makes a talent investor. So, first point, talent investing is always, again, individuals, not teams. So for us, over the eight years, we've seen thousands and thousands of applications. Oh, I'm blocking you, I'm so sorry. I see your head moving. <laughs> Um, all these thousands of applications, they come in, we have an application form, they fill it up, there are questions really to kind of figure out, okay, you may have done this background, you know, all your, um, your career experience, your academic experience, but we're really trying to also figure out if you have the founder mindset. Uh, because a lot of people that we actually bring into, again, people who no, no idea, no team, and most of them, we target deep techs, so a lot of them are PhDs, where for them, the career path of entrepreneurship, it's like has never crossed their minds. So, and then the question is that, when we look at these people, how can we determine that you may have the potential to be, a, be an entrepreneur? I think a lot of people here, we can go down a whole debate of whether entrepreneurship is innate or, you know, or learned and stuff like that. But we do believe that there's a part of it where you can learn, and this is, where, this is why we exist. So we, we interview them, we look at applications, we interview them. At the end of it, we only have a 10% acceptance rate. So even though someone may have a like, like sterling CV, done a lot of things, super smart, the founder mindset is super important. So ultimately, we, get, we, uh, uh, achieve, um, we accept 10%. The last point, the fourth, the fourth point is super important as well. Because it's strangers coming together to potentially form companies, as we all know here, or hopefully we all know, is that you need a mix of skill sets. So for us, we bring in a mix of PhDs, postdocs, some people with two postdocs. You're talking about people with a very deep technology expertise, You're talking about quantum computing, CRISPR gene editing, biochemistry, biophysics, semiconductor, whatever, mathematical modeling, creating some new model that only 100 people in the world can do that. We bring in these academics into the fold. Second kind of people, we bring our domain experts. So people who spend X number of years in domains such as architecture, media, finance. 
So they've, they've worked through the a bit more commercial aspects of a particular domain. They know the ins and outs of a domain. The last bit, business catalysts, we need business people. We need potential CEOs as well. So these are people who have done a lot of commercial stuff, be it um, working in, say, Google, Uber, whatever, doing regional growth. Also, people, ex-founders, with quite a lot of ex-founders, either they sold a company or company failed, um, and then they do join us for another chance, for another shot at creating their own big company. So the mix is super important. So second, we're paying you to try your startup. So some funding details in general, and I won't go deep into it, because we do uh, tailor the amounts to location. So but in general, what we believe is this. If you're trying to create a world-impactful company, we believe that you need to not worry about survival. We believe that you need some amount to take care of your basic needs. So we, we pay you, like in Europe, in Berlin, in Paris, we pay individuals 2,000 euros a month for the first three months. And you don't have to return this. It's not, yeah, it's not reimbursable. Like, we give it to you and that's it, without expecting anything. And after three months, hopefully you have your company, hopefully you have a co-founder. So your teams of two, hopefully you have a co-founder, and you pitch to the EF Investment Committee. So this is the part where it transits, we transit to a traditional, traditional VC. We get pitched by the teams we actually create. And if they pass our investment committee, we then invest in them. Another roughly 80, um, 80,000 pounds, 90,000 euros for 10%. And of course, it, we always have an investor day, demo day as well. So that's where we present the companies at the end of six months to the world's best investors. So we just had um, another investor day in London just one month ago, where we had 29 European teams, so from Paris, Berlin, and London, present to a room full, like almost 500 investors. So this is about more detail, I won't go into that. But essentially, as a talent investor, again, we bring in individuals, for the first three months, they're really, we're trying to help them focus on finding a co-founder, team building. Second part is about, after we do the investment, it's about accelerating them, making sure that they get to a little bit more of a product market fit, really understanding the problem, the solution. And then after demo day, we also support the teams in raising their, their first external seed round. And the third point of talent investing and this is unique to EF, is that we try to support them ideation, and we have a methodology called Edge. What is Edge? Edge is a person's unfair advantage in solving a particular problem compared to other people. For us, it's a framework to work on the right thing with the right person. So this is a framework that we've developed again over the last eight years. We've actually changed it so many times. We called the names differently. You know, we were like, okay, let's have a product person, but we're like, actually, we need more of a, like potential commercial CEO people. We've evolved, but now we have a very solid framework. So I think even though a lot of you are really startups here, I do think that the concept of Edge can apply to, in the, to start, already startup founders as well. Because it's really a superpower, essentially. Just to give you an example, I know there's a lot of words there, I'll just summarize. So Magic Pony, again, this was the company acquired by Twitter for $150 million. Zihan came in with a technology edge. He had a PhD in computer vision, machine learning, visual information processing. And, and part of the ideation process is that he tried to apply this PhD in AI, ML, image AI, into first one of the first ideas was this an idea that many people have thought about, identifying fake luxury goods, like Louis Vuitton and whatever. So I think everyone here, I think we think we agree might be a not so good idea. But so he started with that, evolved, partnered up with another, peop like another, uh, another team member, and essentially, he arrived at partnering up with his co-founder to use partly supervised learning to conjure up image based on previous training, which means that he's filling in the gaps in images can f ultimately fill in Apache video feed or increase the resolution. So yeah, so after 18 months, yeah, they were strangers. Day zero, strangers. Day month 18, F month 18, acquired. 
Another example of Edge, we have, this is domain Edge, so Edge had eight years of augmented reality experience. And basically he created a company that has recently raised an eight million round Series A. And, and his technology is called a vision engine technology, which allows you to input images or videos and output a machine readable, high definition map of the environment aligned to the physical world, so it's location. Our third example for Edge is more of a business catalyst. So Lionel uh, was, worked at Google as a product marketing manager for Google Assistant and many other hardware devices. He tried to do startups before Entrepreneur First, failed. He joined us. Partnered with Patrick at Technology Edge, who had a CRISPR PhD. So the company now uses CRISPR technology. They gene edit plants to remove pollution. Fourth part, part about talent investing. It's always important, it's about finding a co-founder. So some uh, other pairings, I won't go into detail here, very life, tech, uh, very life science focus. We have two PhDs here, specifically tech and tech, with different, both with experiences of microbial stuff, and they form together. So it's about going into the cohort, mingling with people, and you know, at the beginning, you will not know like, who's going to be a best match and also what are you going to create. Because we believe that finding a co-founder and ideation and using an edge is symbiotic. I use the analogy of this. You have your own edge, you have your own experience, your background, how the way you think. When you talk to person A, what you talk about will be different from what you would talk with with person B. And we, we're trying to get away from the analogy of co-founder dating, uh, like dating, but essentially it's kind of like dating, right? We believe that the first person you meet may not be the, your best co-founder. The, the first person you meet may not be your wife or husband. So just like meeting a potential person to be a co-founder may not be a best fit co-founder. So even though we've built teams like that, counterintuitively, it's not really about getting people, the individuals, into teams. Because again, the first person you work with, you sit beside, you may, have, you may enjoy your time together, you may be able to have beers and wine together. But building company is not just about the fact that you can have a social life together. It's about how you can build a company together, how you can be productive together as a team. So for us, it's not about getting people on the teams that's the most important. It's about breaking them up. So in my role, I'm like a matchmaker, as well as like a marriage therapist telling them you're not a fit for each other, I think you should break up. And the key thing is also fast. Because the longer you stay in a bad team, in a bad company, if you're, you, you know, your company is plateauing and stuff like that, it's about when to quit, right? Always faster is better. So within EF, individuals is the average of 2.4 teams. Which means that when you come in, the first co founder I work with, they'll probably break up after either two days, two weeks, two months, whatever, and average of 2.4. So to summarize, why we believe that we are, we are creating something that's very, very unique and needed in the world is because, and also more importantly, that works. Because again, when in VC, you always say, yes, idea market is important, but ultimately it's the people. Remember again to the slide about the market winning. Even if you're in a great market, if the team is not fantastic, the company may, has a high chance of dying. So combining this idea of investing in team and in, in, in people first, combining that the traditional VC model, where again, after three months, they pitch to us and we invest just like a traditional VC, this is talent investing. So since we started in 2011, there have been other kinds of talent investors. So these are some kinds. So Antler, Hackmine, Pioneer, and some of the other similar programs. There's also always new evolution there. The second point, Lambda School in the US, is where it's much more education focused, where you learn coding, you know, and then after that, after you graduate, if you, when you get a job as a developer, you'll get X percent of your income, so income share agreement income, for the next X number of years. So these are different kinds, and um, different kinds of models of talent investing. So for the future, we at EF, we do believe that talent investing will continue to increase. 
And you know, we're happy that you know, other people are following in our, in our, in our domain. Because for us, it's not about like copycats or whatever and, and being, you know, you always say copying is the best form of praise, right? But for us, we really believe that this thesis of investing in people first is very important and will unleash a lot of good, great companies changing the world in a significant way. So again, we invest in individuals, we help them find a co-founder, and we amplify an ambition and build a company. So our website is joinef.com. If you're interested, you can check out more. Thank you very much. Well, Gwen, before I let you go, yes. may, may we we'll probably have time for one or two questions. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, if, can we get the microphone up here? Excellent. Hi. Uh, and you'll, again, the, sort of the rules are your name, yeah, your my, organization. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, my name is Luisa from Guayaquil. Uh, I'm also doing a PhD, so my question is related to, sometimes I'm really careful to say if I am doing a PhD or not, because for VC, they are immediately put you, they categorize that, oh, you are not doing business. So how you identify, or what, what's your validation to see if a, a, a PhD will have a CEO or a founder mind? Yeah, I love that question. That's a great question because we do struggle with that because we, we interview so many brilliant PhDs and postdocs, again, changing the world of the tech in many different ways, which I'm sure you are as well. And the most difficult part during the whole process is switching from the academic mindset to a founder mindset. Because in academia, you need to be like 95%, 98% statistically sure of something, right? Before you write a paper, a whole paper <laughs> about it. But in startups, as all of us here know, it's about what's your hypothesis? What's your hunch, what's your belief? MVP, no, don't even need to build anything, draw it out, right? Draw it out, test it out. So that, that jump is super difficult for many. So during the interview process, we ask questions to ascertain growth mindset. How much you're willing to learn, how you're learning, and also how open you are to receiving feedback. Because when we talk about stuff, I'll ask you what you've done and stuff like that. Now I have a conversation with you and, and I'll ask you about technology and I see how you're, you, you Talk about the future of your tech as well. Yeah. But it's difficult. It's a difficult question. Thank you. Cool. Um, before we go to the next question, I, I do hear some conversation happening, which is great. That's kind of the purpose here. But you remember from yesterday, we want conversations out there, not in here. We want to give respect to the person that's speaking, which you will want oh. when you're up here. So thank you, Bill, thank and thank you, you everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, I have to be the school mom every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so why don't we go over here for a question? Yep. yep. Uh, excellent. Hi, uh, my name is Omer Sal. I run a um, tech-focused merchant bank. What would be your uh, advice for emerging markets and frontier markets uh, startups? Because they have to deal with a lot of different problems each and every day, from market regulation to FX to politics to yeah. social unrest, and, um, and talent acquisition is a big uh, yep. issue compared to the startups you were outlining in Paris or in London. And I mean, oh, those, uh, they have more competitive environments, but lesser structural problems. So yep. how does EF fall into the picture and how do you guys differentiate yourselves in scaling these startups yeah. and these I'll markets? answer that question also from my background, because I've spent most of my career looking at a tech startup space in Southeast Asia, where I'm from Singapore, which is very developed, um, but uh, we're surrounded by countries who have a lot of these problems. Political, it's very shaky, taxes change all the time, the laws, regulations change all the time. So I think for that, I mean, at least from Singapore, we've seen that all of them gravitate then towards actually starting a home office, a, a legal entity official headquarters in Singapore, but still have local offices. So they arbitrage the region by looking at it not just as a particular country, but as a region. So I always think mindset at, at expanding your worldview and not looking at your immediate surroundings, I think that's super important. I think concretely as well, we do see that all these barriers are real barriers. Is there one answer to that? No, because I think also boils down to a, a founder. I've seen some founders stay in their countries or return, let's say, spend X number of years in Silicon Valley, go back to their home countries because they're like, you know what, my home country, X, Y, or Z, is not doing so well. Um, there's a lot of problems, but I want to help. And so these are the people changing stuff as well. I think that's, you need people like that to kind of lead the way in changing environments. It does have to start with a stable source, a stable base in terms of infrastructure. How EF is in a picture regarding these frontier markets is that, for now, frankly, we don't. 
So we've chosen markets where we gravitate towards deep tech talent, where there's a lot of universities, great universities, training all these PhDs and postdocs. So again, like Asia, Singapore was first, Hong Kong is second, which is again another very developed nation. And Bangalore is kind of tech capital of India, right? So we, we've chosen markets this way. But at the same time, we also haven't gone to Silicon Valley because we don't, we don't believe, we believe that Silicon Valley people have all the opportunity you need. I think going to a market like Myanmar at this point, I've, I've, I've done some stuff in Myanmar, for example, right? I do think it's a, it's a lot of potential, but as, as a business as well, we have to pick our markets right to prove our thesis as well. So for us, unfortunately, of, or, you know, we're not playing in those super frontier markets right now. Yeah, but I, I really do hear you that it's super important of all the regulations, right? So at EF, in the countries we do, and again, for our individuals coming to start companies, we de-risk all of that by having our team support in all the legals, starting a company, some legal templates to hire as well, so that also other ambitious individuals can join these kind of ready-made companies. Thank you for the question. Cool. Let's thank Gwen, and Gwen, before I let you go, and before you guys clap, um, <laughs> can I ask you in the next session to be one of our mentors? We're gonna yes. do pitching people, there'll be six companies okay. up here, and so if you take one of those four seats when you go back, that'd be, those are the pressure seats there. Okay. So. All right, well, let's thank Gwen. Thank Excellent. you very much.